but energy is one of those things we we tend to want more of and if we have more energy we're able to do a lot more with life i hear a lot from my clients and just from general murmurs around the place that if i i would do this if i had more energy or if if i had more energy i'd be able to exercise more or i'd be able to keep up with my kids or i'd be able to do this course it really is the 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 goal for a lot of us with what we're eating and if we're to take what we're going to learn today and um, and apply it to our lives it's really that the nutrient quality is really where it's at in terms of energy i'm going to talk a lot about quality and quantity i'm going to talk about fake energy versus real energy you might be surprised about what's actually fake energy and what's what's proper energy and then some tips to take home for stuff that you can do. There will be an opportunity for questions for everybody as well. So um, what I'll get you to do is to in the, the slides that come up and you can write in your questions. So just type them in into the chat and I'll answer those. Uh, there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of spaces for questions throughout the webinar. And um, yeah, you just type them into there. Try not to type them at the time because it's pretty distracting. I tend to lose my um, my train of thought a little bit. So um, if we can keep me on the on the straight and narrow, that would be good for everyone. So um, here we are, energy. Let's talk about energy. First, um, some of you don't know me. Uh, some of you have, have come from elsewhere. My name is Steve Hennessy. My I've been a coach since 2010, functional uh, diagnostic nutrition practice, practitioner since 2016. And I've always believed in a holistic view of health and um, one that follows evolutionary principles. So that's going back to basics in terms of our nutrition, our sleep, our relationships, our lifestyle, our movement. And, um, and what I do now is coach people on that from all around the world using fitness and nutrition and lifestyle coaching. I, I take the, the best that we've got in terms of testing and modern science, but also uh, following the, the nature's protocols of, of sunshine and, and quality food, socialization and movement. And that's what I do. So uh, I've been up this for a long time and um, energy is one of those things that, that I've always been working towards, whether it's training to get more energy or eating to get more energy. We're gonna talk about the eating side today. Um, how this works in the body. Let's have a look here. You might remember this from high school science and um, I hope we're not too traumatized by that. ATP is the uh, energy currency of the body. This is how we, this is what we want to create. That's the end product is ATP. That's our source of energy. And we can create energy from uh, ATP from a lot of processes. Carbohydrates and fats are the main ones. We're going to talk about that. But just like anything in the body, it's not just like a, a energy in, energy out sort of scenario. There's all these steps in the middle word, and that's known as metabolism, to how we get to the end product of, of ATP. So how does food give you energy? This is a good one to look at. We've got fats, carbs, and proteins here. We're gonna go through each of those in a tick. So fats, this is our fatty acids. We've got, uh, think of this as avocado, olive oil, olives, coconut oil. That will create ATP. Glucose will do the same thing, but it goes via a glucose pathway. And protein assists along the way. Protein plays an important role in synthesizing nutrients. But these are really what's important for ATP. And they work in, in different ways to form ATP. Macronutrients, if you don't know this, then we're gonna go through it. We've got carbs, proteins, and fats. Carbohydrates, think of vegetables, breads, pastas, cakes, uh, all the delicious stuff really is high in carbohydrates. And uh, fruits and vegetables as well is our main source of carbohydrates. Four calories per gram there. Proteins, these are think of animal foods are the most common sorts uh, sorts of protein, but also some carbs, carbohydrate dominant foods will have proteins in them and fats as well. A lot of foods are a combination of all three. Well, usually two, sometimes all three. Alcohol is down here as well. Alcohol is, is a macronutrient. It works in the same pathway, has seven calories per gram and actually burns very quickly as well. And uh, this is what it looks like. So you can see there's some overlapping here with the carbs, proteins and fats. Uh, the carbohydrates, these are like rice, oats, potatoes, grains, veggies. These are our foods that are mostly carbohydrates. So there might be a little bit of protein in it, but they're known as carbohydrate dominant foods. Protein, like meat to the most common fish, uh, turkey, egg whites, I've got there, lean beef, whey protein. These ones are uh, more straight proteins. So they're low in carbohydrates, low in fat, and they're high in protein. 
Fats over here, avocado, butter, egg yolks, oils, these are high in fats. But you can see there's a lot of overlapping. The first overlapping I want you to look at is the mix between carbs and proteins here. These are our plant-based proteins, lentils, quinoa, beans. A lot of people who are eating a plant-based tofu could probably go in. Oh, tofu could go into protein, more in the protein side. It's, it's pretty high in protein. And yeah, it's got some carbs too, but it's mostly high in protein. But these are, these are the plant-based proteins that a lot of people have. Uh, but there's always a caveat because they do have usually the same amount of proteins as carbs. Fats and proteins, these are our fattier cuts of meat. Fish is a big one, pork, whole eggs. That's a combination of fat and protein. So, so far we're pretty healthy, right? Like rice, yeah, beans, yeah, chicken, cool, pork, yeah, avocado, all pretty good. But then if we come and combine the fats and carbs, look at this bad boy, chocolate ice cream, fried fruit, cake. If you wanna make a food delicious and highly addictive, then pack it with carbs and fat. This is where we see hyper palatability of foods and uh, the, the brain doesn't really know what to do with it. It just knows to keep on eating. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is a, just a lack of nutrients altogether, but carbs and fats on their own are very addictive. They give us energy. Carbohydrates give us energy. Fats give us energy as well. Carbohydrates give us a big boost of energy. So it's like, yeah, we're up and running, just like we're doing a, a workout. Fats, they give some energy, but it's not that rah, rah, rah energy. Proteins, important for energy, but it's mostly uh, for protein synthesis and muscle growth. So these are our main ones, proteins and carbs. And this is how, and this is an analogy I like to use for metabolism. You've probably heard it before if you've, if you've heard me talk. So metabolism is like a fire. So we've got a fire burning away. Our body is burning all the time. We're always using energy. I'm using energy here. And different macronutrients represent different parts of the fire. So our protein, they are our big logs. So we need those to get, well, to keep the fire going. Uh, they don't burn really quickly. They'll burn for hours and hours. We need them to, to just keep us running. That's an efficient fire right there. Fats, they are our sticks, our kindling. So they'll get the fire started. We don't want to have a, a, a diet that only has fats in it. You'd just be laying a lot of fat on. And carbohydrates, they are our paper. So they get the fire started. So if you think about the fire running, the paper goes into the fire and that'll get things, uh, that'll get things going. Um, ooh, got one more. I'm just gonna keep that up there. Sorry guys, welcome Bron. Sorry, I, um, we just missed a little bit at the start but we can pick up and get most of it. The, the carbs on the fire guys, think of that like, uh, the paper on the fire rather, that's a high carbohydrate diet. So someone that is eating, let's say wakes up, has a, has a glass of orange juice and some toast, really high in carbohydrates and sugar. Uh, dinner, uh, bre breakfast, after breakfast might be a snack, like a muffin. Lunch might be a, I don't know, a sandwich, high in carbohydrate again. Dinner might be some pasta. So you're going up with just paper the whole day. Not a lot of fat, not a lot of protein. So not a lot of support there to keep our energy going. So say if we change that up and we went with a diet that was higher in protein and higher in fat, the first thing that's gonna happen, you're gonna have a longer distribution of energy. You won't have these peaks and spikes. Some carbohydrate is good, a little bit of paper on the fire, not too bad, but we wanna have these two to back it up. So say if we woke up and we had some eggs, uh, lunch we had a salmon salad, dinner we had a curry of some sort with some meat and some, um, some vegetables. Right away, we've got more of a balance there. You'll find out a couple of things. A, you'll probably feel better because all those foods are very nutrient dense. And B, you won't find these peaks and troughs in energy. And that's really what we're trying to get here is a sustainable version of energy. And part of that is eating enough protein and fat. But then comes the food pyramid. This is when things get really sticky. So uh, this was invented in the 70s by the Department of Agriculture in the US. It was uh, adopted by our health department as well, which is crazy. You notice I said the Department of Agriculture as well, not the Department of Health. Department of Agriculture said, hey, we're producing a lot of breads and cereals and rice and pasta. Let's eat six to 11 servings a day. That's what we're gonna recommend here. Six to 11 servings a day of bread, pasta, rice, cereal. Holy crap, like if you look at this, that's just paper on the fire all day. 
really good around like wartime or if you're trying to stockpile, which you might see people doing now because they're so energy packed. But there are very little nutrients in these foods here. You can even see about colors of blue, brown, white. There's not much going on there. Yeah, vegetables and fruits are up here. So they're telling us to eat more pasta than vegetables. Crazy. Vegetables here, more nutrient dense, less energy packed. These are with, with all the energy. This is where calories are. But these are the foods that make us uh, overweight. You, if you've ever eaten a high carb diet, you know what happens. It's very easy to keep eating. And up here we have proteins, which is just madness, like two to three servings of protein and um, you know, sparingly the, the fats and oils. So we really need to almost turn this thing upside down to get, a, to get an energy, um, a, a diet with a lot of energy in it. Um, yeah, so this was a debacle really. This was a, a big problem for uh, people's health because they took it by gospel and it filtered into our food system. It created a low fat epidemic where people were just um, producing low fat foods and eating low fat foods that were just packed with sugar. Again, that's just packing on the carbohydrates here. And that just kills your energy. This is what it creates, blood sugar levels going up and down throughout the day. So this is what happens when we get hungry. So say we're hungry, say we have some blood sugar issues already. If you had a high carb meal at nighttime, you just had some dessert, your blood sugar is going to be a little bit funky the next day. You'll wake up, first thing you'll be craving, and you know this if you're running off sugar, is more sugar because that's what you're, you're craving. That's what you're addicted to. So you have that first bit of sugar in the morning. Our sugar, blood sugar will go up. Our insulin will go up as well, but our blood sugar will go up. And then at about 9, 10 o'clock, it'll go down. And it won't just go down, it'll really go down. And you'll be bloody hungry. Like not just hungry like, oh, I could, I could go with a, you know, a little snack. Like I need a muffin or something of a pick-me-up. It's that mid-morning pick-me-up of usually a coffee and a muffin hits the spot. And then it goes up again and it goes down, it hits lunch and then you're craving something of a high carb and high, usually high fat as well. And it ends up just being a cascade. A couple of things happen. We overeat really easy to overeat if our blood sugar is like that and we usually go for the nutrient poor foods the brain's not quite there you're more likely to make some um, some dodgy decisions with your choice with your food choices there so that again if we go back to our paper analogy that's just paper on the fire all day without enough fat and protein so really the first step with eating for energy be more protein and fat that's where it all starts and this is really what I'm going to put to you guys today is that the problem is not a lack of energy because we've got so much energy to use. You'll be surprised. Like we have energy all day long. Like we're eating, there's more food available now than ever before. It's the problem is not a lack of energy. It's lack of nutrient intensity. And this is really where the crux of today comes in. We have so much energy in the body, but not enough nutrients. And this is where we get into what's an opt uh, the best diet for eating, for, for, for energy. And that's a nutrient dense diet. So these are some more nutrient dense foods here. What is nutrient density? It uh, reflects the ratio of the nutrient content to the total energy uh, content. So foods that pack the most punch, foods that are just stacked with nutrients. This is the stuff that's going to have a lot of micronutrients in it. So we spoke about macronutrients. We're going to speak about micronutrients very shortly. And it gives the building blocks, blocks of protein. Remember how important protein was in the fire? That comes with nutrient density. Moving on. So why is this important? Because the human body uh, needs, like requires 40 different micronutrients for normal metabolic function. So that's not just like, oh, you should get these. That's a need. Like you, you won't exist if you don't have these nutrients. And that should be the goal. We should be aiming for nutrient density as opposed to like eating 150 grams of protein a day or reducing your carb content. If you focus on nutrient density, amazing things will happen. What are the nutrient dense foods? This, will, this is crazy. This will really freak you out. Have a look here. I've divided these up into food groups. Uh, this is based on uh, volume and also the, all the nutrients like magnesium, choline, uh, all the vitamins, everything mixed together and it comes out with these scores and uh, you'll be shocked at what's, what's really the healthy options here. By far the leader, organ meats and shellfish and fish. These ones are super nutrient dense. It's like an inconvenient truth though because organ meats are pretty, <laughs> they're not exactly the, the most appetizing. 
uh, if you can figure out a good way to, to eat with them, they're, they're super effective though. I've had people take up organ meats and the energy's just gone through the roof. It really is a wonder food, super food, let's call it a super food, uh, very effective for um for managing our energy uh, organ meats are recommended now for people who are anemic they are just giving them organ meat straight away and shellfish as well so this is like mussels caviar things like that are um are our shellfish prawns as well fatty fish so these are the salmons the mackerels uh ideally not the really lean fish the fatty fish have just more nutrients in them uh lean fish slightly behind that and then it goes into the meats the vegetables, yeah, vegetables, they're, they're differing uh, qualities. So it's, it's going to go on a big scale, but nowhere near, uh, even when I looked at them individually, nowhere near as much as organ meats. Fruits, yeah, fruits have got some nutrients, no doubt nutrients and minerals. Not as much as you might think though, definitely not as much as vegetables. Nuts have got some as well, with the caveat that they've got some phytates and some other stuff. So we don't want to overeat that. Uh, dried fruit, really low. Really, really. Dried fruit was actually one of the lowest. On oh, animal fats and vegetable fats, they were very low. Dairy does okay. So that's got a decent amount of um, nutrients. It also depends on where we're getting these from. So if we're getting this from a grass-fed, pasture-fed uh, cattle, then these numbers are going to be much higher. And these are our, uh, our legumes, whole grains, pretty low. All these are like the bottom of the period, pyramid that I mentioned before. That's the food that gets us through the wartime, that'll feed a country, but it will also make you, if you're relying on it, pretty sick because they are nutrient, uh, nutrient void foods. This is an important caveat, bioavail bioavailability. And that refers to how much of that nutrient is absorbed. Because a food can have a heap of nutrients in it, so it can have a lot of, um, of potential, and this is something that gets thrown around the nutrition universe a lot. A food can have a lot of nutrients, but it doesn't always mean that us as humans will be able to digest it. Perfect example is grass. So grass has heaps of nutrients in it, but we're not able to digest it. Okay, it'd be good if we could, because we just eat grass all day. We can't. Uh, so this is something that gets thrown up in the vegan community a lot, is that our spinach or insert other plant-based food has as much protein as beef, or has, has as much magnesium as, um, as, as uh, salmon or something like that, where they compare the two. It, it's just foggy thinking at best, because spinach, this is an example I've given here in terms of um, calcium. So it's, spinach has got a shitload of calcium. It's got a lot of calcium, but uh, only six uh, milligrams of the 115 is actually absorbed. So for that, you'd need to have 16 cups of spinach to get the same calcium of that of milk. So we've got to think about that. And that's unfortunately the case with a lot of the plant-based foods. Yes, usually stacked with, with minerals and, and vitamins, but usually uh, a lot of it is not bioavailable for us. We can make this easier by sprout, soaking and sprouting our foods, particularly our grains, they should be soaked and sprouted. Uh, that releases a lot of the nutrients, also releases some of the anti-nutrients. So when we eat some of these foods, beans is a really good example. When we eat beans, say if you eat, say, say if you eat beans like raw, you might die. Like that, it's, so, it's so toxic for you because a lot of plant-based foods have toxins in them to stop animals like us from eating them. So uh, they have them built in there. So the way we get rid of those toxins, they're called phytates, and they're very hard for us to digest. Usually beans, a good example. If you have some beans and you haven't soaked them beforehand, you might your way out of it later on and you'll know about it. Uh, the way we work around that is to soak them and sprout them. That gets rid of a lot of the phytates and then that, uh, that phytate level will go down. Check. We're all good. So that's a, that's a big one for bioavailability, guys. Has anyone got any questions about nutrient density? And if you do, please type it in. Okay, no questions so far. None that I can see anyway. Trying to get a better vision. Okay, so we will soldier on. Oh, I have a question. There it is. Oh, absolutely, that's where I'm going. Does nutrient density relate to satiation? Red, did you see the slides earlier? Maybe, we're gonna go through that now. So, 
Yes, nutrient density relates to satiation. So macro and micro now, so we talked about this. Macronutrients, this, think about function, just basic function and micro is optimization. So we, if we want to live, yeah, we need carbs, proteins, and fats. But if we want to really live and really feel good, micronutrients is where it's at. Think of it like fuel in a car. So macronutrients, yeah, you need the fuel to go, you need the petrol, but micronutrients is the oil. And we can get like premium oil as well. That's the stuff that's going to fine tune things. So micronutrients, these play a vital role in our energy production. So without them, we feel pretty crap. And, um, and we can get by, but we actually need them to, uh, to live. And micronutrients and essential amino acids, they can't be manufactured in the body. We actually need to get these. And a lot of, um, a lot of fatigue issues that people have is actually micronutrient deficiency. And this is where the nutrient density piece comes into play. Because if you're eating a nutrient dense diet, then usually the micronutrients are taken care of. And, um, and the reason these are so important is because the body can't make them. The body can actually make carbohydrate as called uh, through gluconeogenesis. And it can make a lot of the other, it can synthesize a lot of the vitamins and minerals, but it can't make uh, many of these micronutrients. We need to get them from our diet and also some essential amino acids. We need to get them from protein. So some essential foods that we should be going for. The first one is essential fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6. Good news is you're probably getting a lot of omega-6. It's packed in the diet. You're going to see there's the nuts, seeds, uh, all sorts of fast food have omega-6 in them. Really important for brain health, inflammation, cellular health, and you know it as well. When you start eating fish oil or fish, shellfish, grass-fed meat, chia seeds, these are packed with omega-3s. The Western diet has a lot of omega-6s. It's heavily tilted towards omega-6s. These are in our breads, our pastas, our, um, our vegetable oils, and not enough omega-3s. And this is where the inflammation story comes in. Omega-6s are usually pro-inflammatory. Pro Omega-3s, anti-inflammatory. So if we're eating a heap of omega-6s, which are, most of us are, I think the ratio, average ratio, ratio is about 16 to 1 of uh, omega-6 to omega-3, then we're in a chronically inflamed state. Well, we're not necessarily in a chronically inflamed state, but we're eating a lot of inflammatory foods. We're, we're leading to that. Omega-3 is going to balance that out. So omega-3 is going to add to the anti-inflammatory compound. It'll give the body more resilience. So to get through sickness and parts of, um, parts of disease, and it'll help us heal a lot easier because our inflammatory process is high. Zinc is another one. So zinc's anti-inflammatory, which is the cell division. Testosterone is a big one with zinc and also hormone production. We can fit, find this in liver, again, shellfish, red meat, pumpkin seeds, nuts, and yolks. Uh, so these, really good. Pumpkin seeds, yeah, good for zinc and nuts also. But we have a caveat with this, then nuts have a fair few phytates in them. And we don't want to overeat them because they're stacked with calories as well. And you know it as well if you eat overeat nuts, the stomach can get a bit funky. Pumpkin seeds, the same thing. There's only so many you're going to eat. But it can be useful. These should both be soaked as well. Vitamin K2, this is an important one because we don't get enough of it. We don't have enough liver. And uh, beef, egg yolks, and soft cheese butter, they're the main ones. Cardiovascular health, big one for skin as well. These are in a lot of the vegetables too, and it promotes brain function. We want a delicate balance of, um, of potassium in the body. This is, um, this is the K2. B12 is maybe the most important one here. We can only get this through animal foods, liver, shellfish, these are the big, well, just any sort of animal foods. Really important for memory and brain health, nervous system functions, it connects neurons, the myelin sheath, it connects, and DNA synthesis as well. This is, oh, I said vitamin B12 is important. This is extremely important magnesium. A lot of people will supplement with it for a reason. Uh, over 300 enzymes in the body need it. And we spoke about ATP before. This is the stuff that drives ATP. So um, it plays so many different roles and, and we don't get enough of it. Magnesium is in the soil. And uh, unfortunately, our soil, particularly in Australia, is quite depleted due to, um, to large-scale farming. That's another issue. But a lot of the soil, a lot of the foods that we eat are actually uh, devoid of a lot of the nutrients they should have in them. Green leafy veggies, nuts and seeds, fatty fish, bananas, avo, chocolate. Uh, these stuff, these ones here have, um, have a lot of magnesium in them. So this should all be a part of your diet. 
deficiencies. So when we have deficiencies, this is when we see issues. And really common one, vitamin C deficiency. This was, um, I believe it was first recognized when the first fleet came over, or at least people were eating foods with that were weak in vitamin C. So they were just eating maize or something canned when they were um, going from A to B. And uh, they started to get really, really sick. And then they worked out they could put lemon in water and, or lemon in tea, and it would curb a lot of this vitamin C deficiency. Vitamin D, uh, really important for immunity. You're gonna get that from the sun mostly, also stuff from eggs as well. Uh, magnesium we talked about. Magnesium is really common in mental health issues and also, um, also cramping. If you get muscle cramp or gassing out in workouts or just lack of oxygen to the body, that can be caused by a magnesium deficiency. Choline deficiency. So choline, you're gonna find that in eggs and, um, and meat as well. Choline is very important for the brain. So a lot of the nootropics that people have now, nootropics is like a, a, a what are they called, brain drugs? Something like that. But they're, they're people use them for mental performance, they'll be packed with choline. So eggs are the biggest one for that, egg, um, egg yolks and whites. Uh, B12, we spoke about that earlier, and folate too, very important in pregnancy and when you are pregnant, and important for DNA as well. So um, yeah, really important. And there's usually, if we're, if we're not getting enough of one, you'll start to see some symptoms. These are just some of them as well. These are the main ones that I've outlined because I think they're the most important, but there are, there are a lot more to, um, to think about. And this can be a little bit alarming. She's like, oh, am I getting enough folate? Am I getting enough vitamin D? Am I getting, getting enough magnesium? And uh, rather than think like that, and it can be a bit limiting and sort of trying to supplement with each of them, a lot of this is sorted with a nutrient-dense diet. Like if you're eating a diet with enough animal products and enough plants, then you're usually good, you're usually covered, particularly if you're getting those big ones like shellfish and fish and liver as well. This is being used at the moment, uh, triage theory is being used to, uh, to treat micronutrient deficiency where they inject uh, 40 essential minerals, vitamins, amino acids uh, to curb a lot of these neurodegenerative diseases and um, cancer immune function. All of these uh, are coming back to a, a, a link to micronutrient deficiencies. So it's, it's only been realized now and it's, it's, it's new, the triage theory, but um, I think it's got a lot of traction because I think a lot of disease can be curbed by nutrition. And you'll know this if you've, if you've cleaned up your diet yourself, a lot of symptoms and a lot of things that you feel simply just go away. So I think this should be the goal, guys. This is our new goal. Forget about carbs, proteins, and fats. We want to eat as most nutrient-dense foods as possible and tweak macros to suit the goals and lifestyle. So if we work backwards here, tweaking goals and macros, this will take into account uh, what you're doing for your workouts, what you want your body composition, uh, the, like the top 10% of body composition. But if we're eating these nutrient-dense foods, a lot of the energy issues we have, the hormone issues we have, a lot of it will take care of itself. What does it look like? Plants and meats, guys. Animal products and plants. So your plate can look like that and you're gonna get so much bang for your buck. You'll start feeling better instantly. And be liberal with it. Don't worry about measuring too much. The, the, that's the other good thing. A lot of these foods, a lot of the plants particularly, are really high in nutrients and really low in calories. So you don't really need to count your calories. You need to count your calories if you're an athlete or if you're eating like horrendous food because it's so high in calories and so void of nutrients that it's so easy to overeat and you've got to watch it. It's hard to, to, to curb that because of the cycle that you go on. But if you're eating this stuff, then it takes care of a lot of the blood sugar issues. It takes care of a lot of the hormonal issues and things just get wrapped up pretty nicely. Same thing with animal foods and proteins. If we're eating enough of those, then we are satiated. They're like our, our big logs. Back those up with some nutrient dense plants and we're sorted. These are everything that those uh, parts do, plant foods, animal foods, animal foods are hitting all of those down there, plant foods, all those there. And um, that's pretty much all we need really. Questions, micronutrients and nutrient density. I'll check out a room and see if anyone's trying to get in. 
think we're good. All right, we're going to soldier on. Fatigue. So this is the other side of it. What causes fatigue? Fatigue is one of those things that just pops up and we're like, oh man, I wish I wasn't tired because then I'd be able to do this or then I'd be able to do that. And um, fatigue is a funny one because it, it's usually a symptom of something that didn't happen or didn't happen properly. These are the main sources of fatigue that I've come up with. Adrenal mal maladaptation, oxygen delivery, mitochondrial dysfunction, hormone, hormone depletion or hormone dysfunction. Hormones aren't working properly. So these are, again, these are, these are very broad. It's a broad stroke. Oxygen delivery, for example, there's so many things that affect that. Adrenals, there's so many effect, things that affect the adrenals. Mitochondria is really deep as well. Um, like really, really deep mitochondria uh, and hormones too. Adrenal maladaptation, though, the best way to think about this is the sun and the moon. So you're going to be tired if you don't follow the rhythm of the sun and the moon. So here's one here. When we go, when we wake up, we get some sun. This is the highest point of our alertness. This is where we get the most cortisol between about 6 a.m. and 11 a.m. So that's where we want to be doing most of our good work. Most, we're most productive at that, that time usually. And we should really be waking up with the sun. That's when we get that hit of cortisol. Like if you want to wake someone up, what are you going to do? You're going to open the blinds straight away so they get that hit of sunshine. It's like, all right, I'm up now. All right. <laughs> it, it really does get us going. So the more sun you can get in the morning, the better. Then towards the end of the night, that's when the cortisol is starting to shut off. And what kicks in? Melatonin. Melatonin is our sleep hormone. These two are antagonists. So if the cortisol is high, like if you're really stressed throughout the day or if you don't secrete much in the morning, this is actually what adrenal maladaptation is. Say if you wake up groggy and you're groggy, 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 and then you might get like a hit of energy at like five o'clock. You're like, oh, where was this in the morning? Now I can work, now I can train. And that carries on up until the point of like 10 o'clock. You're like, oh, this is great. I'm getting all this reading done, getting all this work done. That's adrenal maladaptation. That's you getting cortisol hit at the wrong time. And that can be okay for like one night, but usually it goes on and on and on because when cortisol is high, melatonin gets shunted. So we can't produce our sleep hormone when we want to actually go to sleep. And this can be a big problem because the melatonin might get produced at like 2 a.m. when we're, in a, we're supposed to be in a really deep sleep. But that means a, like a four hour quality of sleep. And then we've got to get up again, but our body just wants to sleep here. So we have a coffee and a high carb meal to get us going. So you can see how adrenal mal adaptation can cause some issues. Getting cortisol hits at the wrong time. The way we can help that, obey the sun and the moon, get to sleep on time, get morning sunshine, morning exercise. A lot of you guys do that already, which is great. Uh, but, but treat that first few hours in the morning like that. That's where everything's set up. And if you get a good couple hours first thing, then the rest of the day pans itself out really nicely. And usually the sleep, because the rhythm is intact, you sleep, it's very easy to get to sleep. If you've ever been camping or something like that, you know that because you're aligned to the nature a little bit more. You're getting the cues from the sun, getting the cues from the moon, and it's very easy to sleep. It's very easy to fall asleep as well. Very easy to get up with too. So that's a big one, adrenal maladaptation. If we don't have that proper adrenal output, then we will be fatigued. Oxygen delivery. This is a huge one. This is another, this is another topic. Um, this has got a lot to do with metabolic waste. If we've got a lot of metabolic waste in the body, that causes fatigue. It causes excess acid in the body. That can be caused from uh, exercise addiction as well. It can result in exercise addiction. And the way we have metabolic waste in the body is poor sleep. Like if we're just tired and sluggish. Anemia is a huge one. A sluggish thyroid is another and micronutrient deficiency, they come up again. And this is a really interesting one, metabolic waste, because I see this with people if they're, um, like restless leg syndrome is a big one, because if you've got uh, excess acid in the body, you're gonna get tremors and things like that. People just won't be able to sit still. It's like people on their rest day, if they're really addicted to exercise, they'll just be like, oh, I've got so much acid build up in the body that they are just shaking and wanna move. And the only thing to really, uh, to, to relieve that is movement is some, some, another workout to, to get the acid flowing around again. Uh, so that's a big one. Micronutrient deficiencies are a big one for metabolic waste as well. 
if we don't have good oxygen delivery, uh, delivery to the brain, we don't have um, oxygen going to the brain, that's really important. We did a breath exercise last week and um, everyone felt it was like a two minute exercise. But everyone was like, whoa, I feel really energized now. And what that did, it just brought more oxygen to the brain. And that, had a, that has a big impact on, on our energy. So not necessarily affected with food, although micronutrients are there, but the more oxygen we can get throughout the body, um, usually the better it is. Hormones, so we spoke about these last week. So low testosterone, if you have low testosterone, yeah, you're gonna feel really shit. You're gonna feel uh, badly motivated. You won't feel like you have the drive to do anything. Libido will go down as well. Uh, it's really is a sorry story if you've got low testosterone. Uh, if the thyroid is particularly underactive, if you've got a sluggish thyroid that's, in, uh, that's involved in all the metabolism of, of the body, then you'll be very sluggish and low cortisol as well. So we spoke about low cortisol last week. High cortisol is if you're anxious all the time, you've just got to always on the go. Low cortisol is if you're sluggish and you've just got no desire to do anything. Low cortisol, biggest one is sleep. Also nutrients, micronutrients have a lot to do with that. And um, diet's got a lot to do with low cortisol too. And the mitochondria. So the mitochondria, this is my, maybe my favorite part of physiology because there's so many cool things that connect uh, the way we evolve to mitochondria. It's in a lot of bacteria. And at some point there was a, we got mitochondria from bacteria, which is really cool as well. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. So this is the stuff that lights up the cell. So if we want energy, we need to have healthy mitochondria. We know that certain foods are going to help your mitochondria. Uh, fat, high fat and oil foods are going to help it. Mitochondria, it, it's surrounded by like an oily substrate, that uh, substance, and that's, um, that, that oils themselves will help it. And if we have, say, too much acid in the, in the body, we talked about this with the metabolic waste, then that's going to, to surround the mitochondria, but it's going to stop it from actually working. So that's where uh, over-exercise can be a problem with, with mitochondrial depletion. Things that are gonna help mitochondria, well, intelligent exercise, lifting weights is a huge one, like lifting heavy weights as well, really helps the mitochondria. Eating well, eating enough protein, and just intelligent movement is all gonna help the mitochondria. Deficiency, we know that antibiotics really harm the mitochondria. So if you've used a lot of antibiotics in the past, it's possible that these take a bit of a whack and you need to develop them up again. Lack of fats and oils. So fats are, is the start of the hormone process. So it's how we first create energy. So if we want uh, enough healthy cells, fats and oils are really important. I talked about too much acid in the body that can destroy mitochondria. That happens with, um, with the oxidative stress and not enough magnesium. So magnesium is connected to the mitochondria too, again, with the, um, with processing the, the enzymes, the enzymes that need the mitochondria. So if we've got a sloppy mitochondria, we will feel, feel fatigued as well, because the cells will just feel fatigued. Any questions about fatigue there? Any questions about that, just type it in. Oh, <laughs> so I just got a message saying, did you see the chat? It turns out I haven't been looking at the chat. <laughs> Sorry about that. And thank you to the person who sent through that message. Uh, are there any micronutrients that we can't get enough of through diet, through a nutrient dense diet? Should we top up with supplements? Yes, I'm gonna talk about that. Do multivitamin supplements work? Okay, so these are, these are similar questions. The first one is, so with our modern diet, what, what do we not get enough of with, um, with normal foods? And the easiest way to answer that is no, like the foods provide everything that we need, but there are, due to the, the modern food system that we have, we tend to be falling in certain areas. A big one is omega-3 fatty acids. And that's why I think fish oil is a good idea to supplement with. Another one is magnesium. We should have enough of that in the soil. And with the fruits and vegetables that we eat, we don't eat enough. That's another one I think is worth supplementing with. The other one is actually vitamin K2, because I don't think people supplement enough with that. And people have so much sodium in the body and you want a good relationship between sodium and potassium. 
Uh, but so much of the time we're loaded with sodium and don't have enough potassium to have balance in the um, an acid base balance in the cell. So they're the, they're the three that I'd recommend off the top of my head for health. This takes a different turn and this, it's very individual as well. Like say if you're, if you're really struggling, like if you're really struggling with fatigue, I'd have something like coenzyme Q10 is a good one because it boosts that um, citric acid cycle that we need to, to create energy. We're actually going to talk about that really soon. Um, but that wouldn't be needed for somebody who, who isn't suffering from fatigue. Oh, we have a new joiner. Okay. Welcome to that person who just joined. Uh, so multivitamins, yeah, multivitamins do work. Um, the, the studies on them have been very, each is their own sort of thing. So some people it's worked really well for absorption. Some people it hasn't worked very well. I don't think they're a bad idea. There were some, some, some talks a couple of years ago about them causing cancer, but that's only when you, what they do with these studies, they, they make a multivitamin and they give like a toxic amount to a group of poor rats and lo and behold, they get cancer. Like they give a multivitamin, but they'll give like a, a, a dose that's like 20 times the normal dose. And yeah, the, 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 the rats will get cancer. But there's, um, for, for multivitamins, I think they are worth doing if, if you don't get enough from fruit, fruits and vegetables. And they definitely work. I'm just going to put the new person on mute. There we go. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers your question, but if it doesn't, then please, um, please ask again and I'll keep this chat up so I don't miss anything. Uh, this part's my favorite though, so I'm gonna have to hide it down here. So energy versus arousal. It's important to know when you are aroused and when you have real energy. This is a little bit heartbreaking for us because energy is the process of, the, this is the Krebs cycle here, again, from high school biology really complex and the end product is ATP. So this is how we create normal energy in the body, which comes from food, okay? It comes from nutrients and, um, and calories, mac macronutrients and micronutrients. This is what creates arousal in the body. Caffeine is the most common one. Uh, caffeine doesn't actually give you energy, it just usually, it, it, well, it liberates some of the fuel that we've got, like um, blood sugar and things like that but it also blocks fatigue. And that's what a lot of these do here. We have a um, neurotransmitter called adenosine and adenosine is our, um, our neurotransmitter that, that regulates fatigue. So when our adenosine is, is high, our fatigue, we can get tired, which is kind of important sometimes to get tired. But what caffeine will do, it blocks adenosine. That's one of the main functions that it does. So it tells you you're not tired which can be handy, but can also work against us. Like if you're just relying on these, hopefully not this one, but if you're just relying on these to get by, then you're missing the signals from the body. The body's telling you you're tired for a reason and you're saying, hey, shut up, fatigue, I wanna get through. Uh, then, then that can be problematic. Same thing in workouts, like pre-workouts, um, uh, uh, a lot of us take pre-workouts to get through what you're about to do, but again, that's going to just flood you with fake energy with arousal. It's going to, it's going to uh, pretend like you're not tired. Energy drinks as well. They do the same thing. They're horrible. These ones will have a bit of energy in the form of just sugar, but, um, but yeah, just a horrible, a horrible source of energy. And you usually feel tired afterwards because the arousal is worn off and you don't have the energy to back it up. So what they do, they trick you. They trick you into liberating energy that you already actually have. So you will have energy in the body. There's just a problem with converting. That's why you might feel tired. And so really it's an opportunity to say, hey, why am I not feeling optimal? What's stopping me from, from feeling energy? And stimulants is um, hopefully not the answer. Any questions on stimulants? That's a, always a popular one. No. Uh, we're going to move on 
to digestion. And this is another topic. Digestion is uh, definitely related to, uh, and the gut is definitely related to how we, how we feel with our energy. If our gut is crammed up or it's not working right, if you've ever, ever had issues with your gut, you know how it can bring you down. You know how it can really get your energy down. Uh, I'm not going to cover the gut too much because it's too big a topic, but one thing I will talk about is chewing. Chewing is so important when it comes to digestion. Digestion actually starts not by you chewing and producing saliva. It actually starts by you thinking about food, smelling food, seeing food. That's when the digestion process starts. We start producing saliva. We start producing saliva in the gut as well and acid in the gut to, to start breaking down the food that's about to come. So if you are eating food and you're just like guzzling it down like a pelican, then your digestion has a lot of work to do. We need to use our teeth, our saliva, to break down the food. So when it comes into the, into the body, the body doesn't have a lot for it to do to assimilate it. There's some cool studies done with, um, with uh, groups that had, uh, groups that just didn't chew much and groups that chewed a lot. They found that the nutrients were, were absorbed a lot better when the nutrients were chewed. Also, they were found to eat 11.9 uh, fewer calories because the satiation signals are getting to the brain and you're absorbing more nutrients. And we know if you're absorbing more nutrients, you're not going to have those crazy hunger pain. And then you'll lose weight, lose fat and more energetic. And that's a really a key point, feeling more energetic throughout the day. Why would you feel more energetic if you were chewing your food? Well, digestion takes a lot of energy. To digest food takes a lot of our resources. So say if I ate a piece of chicken here, I chewed it a couple of times and ate it. That chicken now is sitting in my gut. The body has to draw all of its resources in to try and break down the chicken. It's like, all right, let's do this now. And then I'm going to start feeling pretty tired because my resources and oxygen and everything else isn't going to my brain anymore. All of a sudden, it's, it's going towards this chicken to try and break it up. What I can do instead is chew the food 32 times for one bite, which is crazy, I know, but see how you feel afterwards, you'll feel amazing. 32 chews for one bite, swallow the food. The gut will need to do a little bit, but it'll absorb all the nutrients. It'll take you a long time to finish your food, but you'll feel amazing afterwards. You won't feel that bloated feeling. You won't feel like you need to lie down. You won't feel that crash in energy so you feel like you need another cup of coffee or an energy drink to keep you going. It really is a different ball game. So this isn't so much in you know, eating more magnesium or eating more, um, more protein or whatever. This is just some lifestyle stuff that we can implement that's going to give us more energy. This is one of the biggest bang for your buck. So 32 and chew. 32 bites for one. Uh, 32 chews for one, um, for one bite. Saliva, nutrient absorption, they will all be improved and you'll feel amazing after you eat. And really, we should feel energized after you eat. It shouldn't be this hugely uh, taxing process. And certain foods are going to require more, more chews, like meat's going to require a lot more chews. It takes quite a bit to digest meat and, um, and these heavier foods, so take your time with it. And sit down with it. Don't have it at your desk. Have it outside in the sun. Take your time without a screen as well, ideally. And that's all I have about that. Any questions about energy? So everything we've talked about today. No. So if we recap, things that you can do straight away, eat nutrient dense food. I've told you what the most nutrient dense ones are. There's some hints there. Variety of carbs, proteins, and fats. Diversity is an interesting topic, but I think diversity is really important in life. That might be changing your friendship group, meeting different people. It might be changing your workouts. It might be changing where you live, how you live and also what food you're eating. The reason diversity is great with the foods you're eating, you're getting a wider spectrum of nutrients. 
and you're getting a wider spectrum of minerals and vitamins. And that's more likely to hit all of your profiles that you need to hit. So a variety of carbs, proteins, and fats. Colorful ones as well. So you should look down on your plate and see all these different shades, all these different colors. And that's a good indication that we've got a good bunch of vitamins and minerals. Go easy on the stimulants. Coffee a day is fine. Um, keep in mind a lot of the other foods are stimulating that we have as well. Obey the sun and the moon. Go to sleep on time. Wake up with the sun. You'll feel amazing. And then chew your food. Chew your food. Give your digestion the, the, what it needs. And, um, and you'll feel good after you eat. That's what we want to get out of this. We want to be feeling tops all the time and needing for energy. If you want some help with this stuff, uh, I take remote coaching for fitness, nutrition, and lifestyles. That's a combination. We do a bunch of stuff. We do nutrition coaching, fitness coaching, and um, and uh, lifestyle coaching is impl implemented with that as well. I do some hormone tests as well if it's relevant for the clients, and I work with clients all over the world. So wherever you are, I will um, I have availability for you. Got a question, does nutrient density depend on the quality of food? Absolutely, farm versus non-farm fatty fish. Yeah, so wild caught fish is gonna be optimal here. Um, there's been some good studies on say, factory raised cattle versus grass fed cattle. It really matters what your animal was eating and it matters how your vegetables are prepared as well. Local is usually better. So if you can source local food, it's often better than organic food. It's often more nutrient dense and you can trust the process that go into it. If um, there's a great movie, it's called The Big the big Little Farm, The Little Big Farm, something like that. It came out recently. It's all about, um, about permaculture and how the, food, the, the way the food is processed right from the, soil, uh, from the soil up, that's going to influence what the nutrients that you are getting. So if you can source your food locally, if you can source it from sustainable so uh, sources, then, then that's going to improve your nutrient density as well. And I think it's a, a better system to be in. Farmed versus wild caught is an interesting one because farm fish, it's just like all the, most of the fish that we eat in Australia is farmed. Like all salmon in Australia is farmed. It'll say it's Australian, which is great, but it's farmed. Uh, wild caught fish is great if you can get it, but then different countries have different practices with wild caught fish. So I'm not so much against farmed fish because there's more quality of control there. Um, what we don't want is to be eating food that's you know, flown halfway around the world and you're not really sure what the, what the process was going into it, even if it is wild caught. A lot of the fish that gets caught around New Zealand is wild caught, so I often we'll go for that. But yeah, quality really matters in the way it's sourced. It matters with the um, omega-3 profile as well. So omega-3s will be higher with, um, with the meats, if the meats are, are grass-fed meats, the, the quality of, of omega-3s, which is the anti-inflammatories are gonna be higher versus um, factory farmed. Stuff like Wagyu beef, that's like a, health-wise, it's a poor quality meat. It's grain-fed as opposed to grass-fed. Grass-fed's like the lean, leaner meats. So um, things like kangaroo and game are really healthy, really good quality. Okay, guys, no more questions, then I'm going to say thank you very, very much for tuning in. Uh, we have a little social after this at 5 o'clock, 5.15, I think. Or was it 5? No, I think it's 5 o'clock with the uh, Fit Lab people and anyone else who wants to hang around and have a peppermint tea with me, then that would be awesome. Uh, thanks a lot. If you've got any questions, reach out and I'll see everyone next time. Have an awesome one. See you later.